All right. Uh, thank you, Ming Ming. So, uh, yeah, an introduction. My name is Kiang. Uh, I work at Pocket Math. Uh, I'm on www.kiang.b. And, uh, yeah, passing expression grammar. So, it's actually, this talk is uh, started as one of the uh, a refactoring effort at our company that uh, we just decided, okay, we should go uh, a different route and then uh, I had to present to our team and then, uh, and then I thought, why not just share it to the Ruby community as well. And uh, basically, I'm just uh, beginning to learn this as well, so I'm by no means uh, an expert. Mm. Oops. All right. Uh, yeah. So I work at Pocket Math. We are uh, an advertising, programmatic advertising company. You can check out uh, our product uh, if you want to increase uh, your conversion. Uh, yeah. And again, a disclaimer I'm not an expert in compiler design. Uh, it's uh, just a sharing that uh, I've learned over the past couple of weeks. And uh, to start off, we'll set our objective to be uh, implementing a DSL without using eval or instance eval in Ruby. Right? Uh, DSL is basically domain-specific language. Um, oops, oops, too fast, too fast. Uh, an example, if you guys use Rails, a lot of people raise their hands, so you would have uh, seen this before. You declare uh, resources articles, which has uh, comments as its nested resources. So this is a, a form of domain-specific language. Anyone knows what this is? Shout it out. <laughs> yeah, so this is routes uh, in, in Rails, right? Uh, another example, quite easy too, it's uh, RSpec. It's also, to me, uh, a domain specific language so you if you read it it's it is ruby but it's also uh, in the language of testing right you say okay the subject here is going to be object uh, before any the test any of the tests you have to do this and it expect that this uh, will equal to whatever uh, you, that you expect so it's uh, it's a language and and for us, we had this feature of, uh, that we call rules, which uh, you can read about at uh, our blog post, uh, which is a DSL that we designed for our customer to use, uh, to use our platform. So one of the rules example is like this. Say the customer will think of uh, automatically changing uh, a variable in uh, the configuration of their campaign, right? Uh, one of it is, say, the publisher's uh, cost per mil, right? CPM. So they'll say, OK, if the publisher's impressions is more than 1,000, then you set this CPM to this particular formula. Uh, this is just one example. You can do a ton of other things. You can suddenly you want to pause the order. Uh, you can want to start the order. You can save the publisher name to a particular list. Uh, so yeah, you can find out more at the at the blog post here, and so this is the feature we want to implement this without using eval. Uh, but now I'm gonna just focus on this last bit, which is the the formula that will evaluate into a f uh, floating point number that we can set into our campaign uh, configuration right to the publisher CPM. So the easiest way is just evaluate it. Uh, just make sure before you evaluate, the publisher is there, order is there. Impressions and win rate are the legal methods. Uh, and in the form, we just educate the user, OK, you have to call publisher spelled like this. And you can only call win rate and a couple of other attributes, uh, for similarly for order. So yeah, the validation is just tedious to do this. And when you see eval, this should be your reaction. It's just nasty, nasty things. <laughs> Right, because it's easy, but then the responsibility to validate it, uh, yeah, is huge. Right, because there could be crazy things like that. And validation, though, is not trivial because 
uh, yeah, like I said, you have to educate the user. Okay, hey, if you put anything other than impressions with a plural impression, then it doesn't work. Uh, we have to think about uh, because we don't do uh, eval, right? So then we have to handle the operation precedence. If the bracket is there, you have to evaluate those first, things like that. So uh, it was difficult. And at the start, we just do regular expression and just pass. And then, oh, OK, if uh, the order is there, these other attributes should be uh, allowed. Um, yeah, check that the operations uh, multiply, addition, those things are there. And, but there are still abuses that can happen, right? And it's ugly. You see this block of code, you wouldn't want to read it, right? Um, so, so that was just the formula. And if we think about the whole DSL, it's even harder to validate, right? If you need a condition there, and then it needs to follow by then. So your regex that will validate all this is just going to be crazy. So uh, the way we go about it is we don't let the user actually write the language. We use UI to enforce most of the, the DSL, right? So, but essentially, the users here are doing their program, right? They're saying, OK, if the imp publisher impression is more than that, or else, and then you do something, blah, blah, blah. So this is sort of a program that we um, empower our user to do. But we still are stuck with the last one. Right? You have to set the value to a formula. So today, uh, and that's how uh, we had to okay, just find a better way. And then uh, here, I shall introduce PEG, Passing Expression Grammar. Uh, it's sort of like a more modern tool to attack this problem, right? Uh, more semi-formally, it PEG describes languages, and it does so in a top-down manner. Uh, for example, the three lines there, pseudocode, it will describe a mathematical expression like uh, you say an expression can be uh, can can be a term which can rep which can have a addition or subtraction with another term, and it can repeat zero more times. A term in turn is a factor which can be multiplied or divided by a different factor. And a factor is a bracket uh, expression or a number. So with this, you can, uh, not sure you can see here. You can describe things like this 23 plus 45 multiplied by 5 minus 1 can be passed. Can be, it's de described by that language. And you can break it down into a tree. Right? And it's top down in the sense that it'll try to match uh, from the top, from the whole expression, and then at the end of the, uh, each single one. So at the end of the day, you get a factor which is 23, an operation plus with another term here, which breaks down further. So here you can break down into a number, another operator, and then another number. So, so with this three line, you can describe uh, a met, uh, just purely numerical expression. So let's say we want to support variable. And we just say, OK, a factor on top of being a number or an, another expression, it can also be a variable, so, uh, which is a subject or an attribute. Uh, subject dot attribute, right? So and then subject, you can define further what are your legal subjects, what are your legal uh, attribute for our Example just now, the subject would be either publisher or order. And then the attribute would be the impressions, the CPMs, um, uh, and things like that. Yeah, so it's very easy to extend the language in this sense. Uh, OK, later on, we'll sort of visit this again. And uh, you'll see that if in a case where there, there's an operator, we can uh, I'll call one the L term, the left term, the operator term, and the right term. So we'll come back to this later. And uh, so that's PEG. And that was all pseudocode, right? And uh, in Ruby, I've only explored two alternatives, two gems. So this is 
yeah, unfortunately, the, those things that you just uh, <laughs> gem install and hope that life is peachy. <laughs> uh, so one is parslet and another one is a slightly older one, tree top. Uh, I didn't go all the way for the tree top gem. It looks much closer to, to the PEG um, pseudo expression, right? But it just doesn't feel very Ruby-ish, right? Ruby-ish to me. So uh, for Parslet, you're basically uh, just subclassing uh, one of the gems class, and then you define the rule. And then at the end of it, you can use the parser and just pass a string. And one of the output from parsing it, so from here on out, I'll only be talking about parslet. <laughs> one of the output, which is e, right, is just a hash, which is in that sort of state. So let's say our expression here, we are able to break it down into a tree, which at the leaf node, you'll see that it's very recognizable. We can only have three shapes. It's either a variable, which will uh, be a hash of a subject and attribute. It will be either a number or an L O R hash, right? So it's the left operation and the right. Yeah, so the right will be one of the other two. So, yeah, so suddenly our formula is very structured. So, um, and PEG sort of, sort of ends there. Uh, it's just this, le le this thing that describes languages and helps you pass out the structure. So the cool thing is that uh, what we can do with PEG's output is supported by Parslet is to evaluate, to quickly collapse all those tree back into one value. Right? So you can uh, define an evaluator which will expect, let's say, the variable term previously, you know that it can have a subject and an attribute. So you just uh, do some checks there. And then subject, send, attribute, just make sure they are symbols. And if it is a number, yeah, you can just make it uh, uh, cast it to string and then to rationale. For, uh, you could do it to float as well. Uh, and then if it's a uh, left operation and right, yeah, you just the left term, which will already been calculated into a number. Because this, each of these two terms, the leaf of the left, right, will collapse into a float. And then with a float, you can send the addition sign with the right as the argument. So at the end of it, all of these three will evaluate into, into a number. And and with the same class, you can evaluate. Uh, you can have your own eval, right? Which is much safer. So you can't do any RM things here because immediately you'll put the string into your parser, which will raise an error if it doesn't match uh, our language. And then, yeah, you can just apply passing in your order and publisher into it. So um, yeah, it's much safer with your own evaluator. So the way that we can use eval now is, OK, we have an expression. We can just evaluate the expression itself, uh, giving it the order and publisher instances. And we know what the error can come out uh, at the passing step, etc. All right, so, uh, so this is where we were. Previously, we used just UI. Uh, to help the user go through that big part of the DSL, right? And then uh, in the last bit, the formula, we just um, brute force regex and ng sub it. Um, but after we move to it, uh, to PEG, it's, it's just a way that I see that, okay, now rule, uh, mapping from the rule in the user's head into the execution is uh, a little bit easier to reason about. And then eventually, we can even remove the UI step and en enable a separate uh, channel uh, when we support the if and the then 
part of the rules. And uh, yeah, I'll put a quote here by Donald Knuth. Let us change our traditional attitude to the construction of programs. Instead of imagining that our main task is to instruct a computer what to do, we should concentrate rather on explaining to other human beings what we want a computer to do. So uh, the idea is that keep your code readable because yeah, you, your teammates and yourself will thank your, uh, your readable code uh, later down the line. Uh, yeah, so that's uh, my presentation on PEG. Any questions? How do you keep the uh, how do you keep the grammar and the UI bit in sync? Because the stuff that you need to if you're generating if you're generating statements, right, that you're then subsequently passing back. And I'm imagining you want to have a structured way to generate that UI bit to begin with. Yeah. So right now we we only do the PEG for the last bit. Okay. So the formula. So this is a text box. And yeah, you're right. If we we need to support this UI, the UI will have to evolve as the language that we uh, support evolve as well. Yeah. Which is a pain that we are facing now. Like uh, because. These rules is evolving very quickly, and uh, we it's just like every time we have to update, OK, we have to support an, another operation. For example, we, have to, we had to support a time range on, uh, on each variable. And then suddenly, we have to redo the whole form. And yeah, that's, that's something we're still thinking about. Uh, yeah. This library that your, your team is building, um, is this a closed proprietary uh, library? Oh, actually, open source? Parslet is actually not uh, the, our company's. It's an open source one. Okay. Right. Yeah, so what we do is, um, if you see this rules feature is, uh, yeah, we just use this Parslet thing so that uh, when we evolve the rule languages, it's just easier to maintain the code. Uh, there's really no proprietary thing going on here. Any more questions? OK, thank you, Kim. Thank you. <laughs>